shakedown before you break down. Shakedown hikes, gear shakedowns, a very, very common practice. But what happens if you don't do that? What are the most common items that hikers are sending home after the first few days or weeks on the trail? I took the opportunity to call up my friends at Mountain Crossings this week and had a great conversation about what the most common items that they are seeing in their gear shakedowns that they do with hikers that they're sending home and also what are the most common items that hikers are picking up there hey welcome back hikers to follow bigfoot where knowledge is our niche to hike in the outdoors if you're new to the channel welcome subscribe to the channel we cover everything and anything that you need to not just get prepared for your through hike and get started but get you on the trail and get you to wherever your final terminus may be what are the most common items that at through hikers are sending home during their first opportunity on the at which happens to be at neil gap mile marker 32 i think it's actually like 31.7 there's an outfitter there called mountain crossings and they do something that is a free service for hikers and that's a gear shakedown now these free gear shakedowns are done by one of mountain crossings qualified staff that either have extensive backpacking experience or have already through hiked trails like the Appalachian Trail. They know what through hikers need and they also know what through hikers don't need. Now, during this gear shakedown, we came up with a list of seven of the most common items, categories, themes that they see hikers sending home. We're also going to cover some of the items, the most popular items that hikers are also purchasing from that outfitter. Now a little bit more about Mountain Crossings. They're located in Blairsville, Georgia, right off of Gainesville Highway at Neil Gap, as I said earlier. They also offer a hostel, which accommodates 14 hikers. They have bunk beds there. It's a first come, first serve basis. Now typically on a rainy day, it's gonna fill up by about noon. And then on sunnier days, you're talking about sometime three to four o'clock in the afternoon. There are staff don't get any commissions on anything that they sell you and their prices at Mountain Crossings are a market price. Mountain Crossings is a very, very popular area and kind of the first big major accomplishment that a AT through hiker has, getting to Neil Gap, hiking the first 32 miles, getting past Blood Mountain. It's also an opportunity for hikers to resupply for the first time, make any adjustments that they do need to make. I called up Mountain Crossings and I spoke with Leah, which is one of the managers that runs the outfitter and also one of their associates, Sam. Now, I've talked to Mountain Crossings before. They actually helped me put together a video that I recently published called Five Reasons Why You May Not Want to Start Your Through Hike in March. If you haven't seen it, I'll link it above here. We came up with a list of the most common gear items that hikers are ditching after the first 32 miles on the AT. Now these seven items aren't ranked in any sort of particular fashion or order, but these are all just major things that hikers are ditching. The first category being clothing. Walking in among crossings, a lot of hikers have way too much clothing or they do not have the right type of clothing. One of the, the common themes is hikers coming in with a lot of cotton clothing. It seems a trend that the more mature and older generations are carrying cotton because a lot of the younger generations, that's not what they're wearing today. It's a lot of the Nike dry fit uh, stuff and things like that. In addition to that, a lot of just bulky clothes and not the right setup for clothing, what they need for the conditions that they see on the AT. Now the key here being that you wanna have material that's synthetic, that's going to be able to breathe, that's gonna be able to wick, but that also can keep you warm in wet conditions. The best materials for that is wool or fleece. If you're gonna be hiking in the earlier part of the year, January, February, March, going into April, wool and fleece are gonna be the best materials for you to handle the conditions that you're probably gonna see while you're on the AT. It is not uncommon to be able to get temperatures down into the low teens, maybe even single digits, and it's really rainy, it's wet. So the combination of wet and cold really makes for disaster out there if you don't have the right clothing. First aid kits, that is category number two. A lot of hikers are coming in with those very big extravagant first aid kits that has every cream, every sort of bandage, ice pack, 
anything and everything that you possibly need to survive in the wilderness. Some of these things I'll add into this list is bear spray. Bear spray was probably one of the top three items that I saw in hiker boxes in Georgia. You don't need bear spray, I promise you. Now the thing about hiking the AT, think of it as hiking from town to town. You just need to get to your next resupply point. For most people, that's going to be somewhere between four to seven days. There are many, many opportunities for hikers to get off of the trail. On average, on the AT, I believe the stat is every four miles you're gonna pass a road. Now that, again, that's on average. You have to just get to that next resupply point or even that next road crossing. There is not a need to bring these extravagant first aid kits because honestly, you are not going to use 99% of the stuff that's in there. What I recommend and what I bring, athletic tape. I have been bringing Katie tape, but a lot of hikers love Luco tape. Maybe like two, three bandages, a few ibuprofens, and then usually some needle and thread. Category number three is toiletry kits. Bear spray was one of the, one of the more common items I saw in hiker boxes, but by far, camp soap was number one. There is a theme here that Sam said, typically women are carrying more toiletries and they're carrying like the shampoos and some of the soaps and things like that, maybe even conditioner. Toiletry kits are one of those items that I think it's easy for hikers to go, yeah, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Once you get out there, you start to realize that it is difficult to fend off that stench, that hiker stench that you're gonna have anyway. There is only so much that you can do. Deodorant is one of the items that almost every hiker gets rid of if they even start with it. I am one of the very, very, very few people that actually carries deodorant. It's one of my luxury items because it just makes me feel better. Although I know I still stink, it's just a mental thing for me. It is definitely not something that hikers need to carry and most hikers will not. My toiletry kit looks like this. Toothbrush, a very small tube of toothpaste, floss, I recommend it. I do bring deodorant, like I said, very small bottle of sunscreen. And then I personally bring Dr. Broner's soap. I use that in a very small vial and I use that to wash my hands in a Ziploc bag which I discard the water away from camp, away from water source. A lot of hikers are going to bring sanitizer as well to really clean your hands and get the germs off, especially if you're going number two. Uh, really the only way to do that is with soap. The reason why I use Dr. Broner's is you only need a very, very small amount to create the effect that you need in the water uh, to be able to wash your hands. Fourth category, electronics, Kindles too many charging cords, big battery packs, bigger than the hikers need for what they're bringing. A lot of hikers are bringing both a GoPro and a camera. A lot of hikers are just ditching the camera and keeping the GoPro. Now what I personally bring for my electronic setup will be a little bit different because I am vlogging out there. If I was through hiking a trail like the Appalachian Trail, I would be bringing a 20,000 milliamp battery break, which is gonna be bigger than what most hikers need. I would be uploading my videos actually on the trail and I would need enough juice to be able to do that. I bring the Anchor PowerCore Speed 20,000 milliamp PD. The reason why I bring that one is I pair it up with my Anchor PowerPort Atom wall charger. It's a brand new wall charger from Anchor. It weighs about 1.9 ounces, which is heavier, a lot heavier than your regular wall charger, but the combination of those two, I can charge a 20,000 milliamp battery brick in three and a half hours. When I threw hike the AT, the 20,000 milliamp uh, RAV power charger, actually I think it was like 16,700 milliamp, something like that. That one would take me about 16 hours when I was completely dead to completely charge it when I was using a regular wall charger. I have my Garmin watch, which needs to be charged. It's a GPS watch. I also bring a GPS or satellite device. I use the Garmin InReach Mini, the Nightcore NU25. It's my preferred headlamp. That thing only comes in at like 1.15 ounces. That's rechargeable. I also, of course, have all of my cables for my devices. And then I also have my phone slash camera. What I bring is more on the extreme side. It's really what is the right fit for you. Fifth category is sleeping bags. Many hikers are walking to mountain crossings and their sleeping bag, they've had it. it. 
is way too bulky. Sam actually mentioned that many hikers that he sees and he does shakedown hikes on, they don't even have a dry sack for their sleeping bag, and that sleeping bag is taking up about 80% of their entire pack. Getting the right dry bag, and actually Leah recommends to just get a trash bag and use your entire pack as an entire dry sack. Uh, I use a, a dry sack for not just my quilt, but also my clothing. I fit both into that dry bag. The sleeping bags that hikers are coming in uh, at mountain crossings are just very big, heavy, bulky. A lot of hikers are bringing in sleeping bags they bought from Walmart. Now my go-to quilt of choice that I've been using lately is Enlightened Equipment's Revelation. I have a 20 degree in that. I also have one in a 40 degree. The degree range is going to depend on the time of year of when uh, you are hiking. Most hikers that are starting in March are going to probably have a 20 degree bag. If they sleep cold, they might have a 10 degree bag. I didn't start till the end of April and I had a 40 degree bag, so it just really depends. The sixth category is water bottles and bladders. Many, many hikers come walking in with both of those and it's highly recommended from the staff at Mountain Crossings to just go to smart water bottles and I agree with them. That's what I personally bring on my hikes. That's what I did on the AT. It worked out great. I brought two one liter smart water bottles. These Nalgene bottles and bladders just weigh a ton. Now I know there are a lot of folks out there that are very particular with bladders, but I'm telling you most of the through hikers figure this out on the trail. The seventh and final category is food. Most hikers have days of food extra when they resupply and that's what they have with them as they go into mountain crossings. Now mountain crossings doesn't really recommend to drop food uh, for liability reasons I'm sure, but I did a video on this about food and hikers, what, what, what's the right amount of food to carry and how to kind of get there. I'll link it above here, uh, but honestly, it is a common issue that almost every hiker goes through. Me personally, I did the same thing. My target typically was to have no more than one to two pounds worth of food on me as I hiked into town. Now I asked Leah, what is the average base weight that is dropped after a gear shakedown of theirs? And she said it's probably somewhere between six to 10 pounds, which is enormous. A lot of hikers still leave mountain crossings with a lot of items that they recommend dropping that they don't. So there are potentials to drop more. And honestly, some of that, the hike, the through hiker just needs to learn that on their own. And you will. You will as you hike more miles, you realize that a lot of stuff you just really don't need. Me personally, if I was given advice about base weight, I would say that most folks should try to stay under 20 pound base weight. I think that's more than achievable and more than achievable even with a tight budget. I talked to her about the most common items that hikers are purchasing at mountain crossings. I was really interested on this. The first thing without any thought was sleeping pads. A lot of hikers don't realize that they need insulation for their sleeping pads. I actually talked about this video. It's a great video. It's one of my favorite videos personally about our value, what it is, what it means, and what it means to you. I'll link it above here. Highly recommend that you watch that video. That's gonna tell you everything and anything that you need to know about our value when you're picking out your sleeping pad. Second most common is shoes. A lot of hikers are training their shoes because they're just not working for them. I asked her if there's like particular themes of shoes that aren't working, and, and she said, no, not really. It really depends on the person, on their gait, how big of a shoe size that they got, which by the way, recommend that you get at least one size up from whatever your shoe size is. My shoe size is 10 and a half. I actually go 1.5 sizes up. Your feet are going to expand the more you walk. Most hikers, she said, are coming out of mountain crossings with trail runners. The third is clothing. When they're dropping their cotton clothing, they're dropping their bulkier clothes, then they're trading that in for clothes that are working for them. Synthetic clothes, I mentioned in those colder conditions, wool fleece, or just even adding layers. 
A lot of hikers just don't have enough layers, so they're adding clothing, Sawyer filters. Those things, Leah said, are just flying off the shelves. Now, there's a few different Sawyer filters out there. They have the mini, they have the regular screens, and they have the newer one, which is the micro. One thing just to note about the Sawyer, and this is something that Sam had mentioned. I've said this before in previous videos, but make sure that you don't have your Sawyer filter or your filter in general staying out below freezing conditions. Sleep with it, put it in a plastic bag, throw it in your sleeping bag when you sleep at night. During the day, if it's going to be below freezing, keep it somewhere close to you that's going to stay warm because if that filter freezes, the membrane is going to crack and then it's useless. It's not doing what it's intended to do and you're going to have to replace it anyway. Sam added this one in. On rainy days, it's very common for hikers to come in and buy rain jackets. Uh, not that they don't have a rain jacket, it's that the rain jacket they have is not fit for them. It's not working. Well, that wraps up the most common items that AT3 hikers are dropping at mountain crossings and picking up. I did ask Leah how often they're doing shakedowns, and she said that this year the number is down than years in the past. Uh, she's not sure if hikers are just better prepared or what, but they're averaging about two shakedowns a day. Now we're in the thick of things with spring. It's going to get to 71 degrees here in Minnesota in April. I am so stoked because last weekend it literally snowed. I can just taste that summer is right around the corner. With that comes mosquitoes. Many of you that followed me last year know one of the things that I use to remedy mosquitoes is this natural mosquito repellent, mosquito patch. Uh, I've used the last couple of years, I use in the backyard uh, when I'm out, whether we are uh, doing some sort of activity outside or uh, maybe having a couple of cocktails out there and playing some yard games. I've even used it in the back country, uh, depending on the area, on extreme areas of mosquitoes, it's not gonna be very effective, uh, but places like your backyard and neighborhood. I personally started using these just because I got sick of putting off on me, smelling like uh, off the rest of the day, which by the way, a lot of parents don't wanna put uh, some sort of chemical on their kids. And this is a way to uh, avoid having to do that. You just place the patch on the top of your body and on the bottom of your body on your clothing. Now, just like years in the past, we're bringing these patches back to the channel and offering a 20% discount to all the subscribers. I will uh, place the link for Amazon below in the description box. The promo code that you want to use for Amazon is mpatch20 and that will give you your 20% discount. Now that wraps things up. If you found any value, learned anything new in this video today, make sure to give me a thumbs up. I'm going to go outside and enjoy this 70 degree weather that we're going to have today and get a few things done out in the yard. I hope you all have a fantastic Easter Sunday and I'll see you guys next weekend.